Welcome back to our panel discussion, Using Facial Recognition to Secure the Homeland and Enhance Customer Experience, sponsored by NEC here on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. My guests today are Nick Megna, Unit Chief of the Biometric Center of Excellence Program at the FBI, Patrick Grother is Computer Scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Arun Vemery is Director of Biometrics and Identity Technology Center at the Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology Directorate, and Matt Pruitt is Chief Federal Solutions Architect at NEC Corporation of America. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. And uh, part of this discussion is security, which is the obvious use case across the government for facial recognition, but really high on the agenda for the administration and for quite a number of agencies is enhancing customer experience. And of course, this is an idea that goes back many, many administrations, but the technology and capabilities of technology as applied to customer experience has really advanced a lot in the last couple of years. So maybe maybe talk about how uh, interactions with other federal agencies, your own employees, and if applicable with the public, and I think that's probably a little bit of that is true of almost every agency, how facial recognition and biometrics can enhance that CX idea. And Nick, we'll start with you. So when you talk about the FBI's large back-end biometric matching systems, those are interfaced with by tens of thousands of federal, state, and local and tribal criminal justice agencies. The FBI leverages a shared management approach to really uh, come up with the policies and the technical approaches with regards to these systems. And that approach is the Advisory Policy Board, which is chartered under, under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And it's made up, the advisory process is made up of all the states, local agencies within those states, federal agencies, and national security representatives. And that's how we come up with our recommendations and policies that we push up to the FBI director. Within that framework in our biometric systems, we have an open specification that's referred to as the Electronic Biometric Transmission Specification. And for almost two decades, this specification has ensured backward compatibility with tens of thousands of federal, state, and local agencies who often aren't overly funded for the systems mm -hmm. that they develop to interface with our systems. So that in itself has been a success for the criminal justice community. We also certify biometric devices for use with the systems to ensure that image quality and fidelity is there uh, because these are major decisions being made with these biometrics. To date, we've certified over 800 devices that are vendor agnostic across all of the vendor community, and we post them on a website for all of criminal justice to be able to go and purchase those products knowing that they can be used in compliance with our systems. What are the nature of those devices, like cameras or? Fingerprint mm -hmm. capture devices, mobile fingerprint capture devices, flat fingerprint capture devices, rolled devices, as well as printers and scanners. Okay, what about facial? Is that uh, any of those yet part so of we, that ecosystem? So we don't certify cameras because that would be nearly impossible to do considering the camera market, but we do have best practices that we push out for mugshot capture and in partnership with NIST, NIST pushed out a special publication that has subject acquisition profile levels for image capture of mugshot images. Uh, so we refer to more of a best practices approach for that and standards. Okay, and Arun, you mentioned you know there are many possible new use cases mm -hmm. within the Homeland Security panoply beyond CBP, and I mean, I can imagine many of them. For example, I'm just making this one up, but say FEMA, uh, where they have an issue of identifying people eligible for benefits in the aftermath of a disaster. They could be, if they're, say, living in a flood-prone area, for example, or a fire-prone area, could they be, say, pre-registered using facial and then at the time of emergency there's a real quick way to say yeah that's them and that's where they live and therefore they're eligible that kind of thing but you tell me yeah so one of the things is uh, in, in this customer experience context oh yeah so uh, to your point about customer experience I think one major thing to mention there is once upon a time with this technology it was usually either very secure or very easy to use but probably not very secure the technology between both the collection process and the cameras as well as the algorithms has dramatically shifted how those two, what were used, what used to be kind of opposing forces. Uh, so you can actually have very fast, very convenient collection that is also very accurate. Um, so that paradigm that used to be there 
isn't really in there and to the same extent. So you can find very fast, very easy to use um, uh, s systems that work quite well. One of the things we've done, uh, recognizing that, you know, they're, they're, we actually, so we look across a, a lot of our operational users, but we also support, um, you know, some different things with regard to uh, the different critical infrastructure sectors as well. Uh, one of the things we, re we realized was there really is a fundamental need to have a really good, fast, easy process to say, I don't know who people are on one side of this line. They have to go through this process. And on the other side, we need to be really confident about who they are. So uh, a couple of months ago, we kicked off this thing called the Biometrics Rally. We invited industry to participate. Uh, we basically said, you can put in whatever combination of technologies you'd like but we're going to evaluate you on a few things. Well, first, security aspects. Okay, are we able to match you? How well are we able to match you? Uh, we're going to look at transaction times and throughput because efficiency is a big part of this. Uh, a lot of people think about purely security, but really it comes down to, in a lot of cases, uh, how much time is a person interacting with the process and what's my staffing associated with that process. But then we also evaluated on user satisfaction. So the companies came in, they brought their technologies, they had them tested as part of this process, and we provided them back with feedback so that they knew exactly how well they were working, where they were having errors and problems, what the people who were volunteering to be part of this process, uh, what their perception of the use of the technology was. But the other part of it that probably we don't emphasize enough was we invited a lot of other stakeholders. Uh, we had probably about 100 folks from different, 20 different federal agencies, as well as a number of airport and airlines come in and see and observe the technology. Because if you get that process right, it can be applied to any number of applications. Yes, border security, maybe aviation security, maybe um, uh, critical infrastructure uh, access to, to sensitive areas, right? Bu uh, government building access controls, right? These are across the board, and if you can do that particular operation very well, make it very you know uh, easy to use for people who are either frequent users or very infrequent users, and they can all use it equally well, um, it becomes a really powerful capability. And for us, one of the things that we wanted to do was bring in external stakeholders like airports and airlines because that helps to make the market honestly larger. It gives companies more of a bigger, in a greater incentive to make the technologies work better so that it's not only available for government use, but it's available for commercial and private use as well. So I really think DHS has done a wonderful job at doing this. It used to be biometrics was set apart. You know, 10 years ago, you'd think the word biometrics, you'd think law enforcement. Now it's all about experience. So taking facial recognition as part of that ecosystem and adding in human factors really helps to both increase the awareness of biometrics and make people want to use it while increasing their experience in the system. So that overall adds to the security aspect. When people want to use biometrics to make their life easier, it makes acquiring the face easier. It makes it easier to walk through a system, which adds back to the data and the experiences we can do. With NEC, what we really looked at when we were developing some of our systems was working with commercial industries as a partner. So it wasn't a product we put out and walked away. We actually worked with a major theme park to create one of our facial capture devices. And when you can do facial recognition at a theme park, you know, dark rides, outside in the sunlight, children as young as five up to adults. Wearing funny hats. Exactly. You can actually put that into the aviation space. You can put that into the hospitality space and put that with the government. Adding all that experience feeds back into the security aspect because we can deal with a lot more data at lower quality. And it sounds like uh, the implication here is that accuracy, while that is the ultimate pursuit of the new algorithms and the new capabilities, speed really has to be part of it because if accuracy takes three weeks of processing time, then you really haven't gained anything uh, for almost any use case. Patrick, is, how does that figure into the research and in the, in the, in the work that you do? This is part of the, the system that, that, that we've all referred to, that you've got a camera at the front end, you've got a, maybe an analyst at the back end and an algorithm in the middle, and it's, it's the entire chain that will, give, uh, a, will be responsive or not. So a good quality camera that is understanding what a face is um, which legacy cameras don't really do, that is aware of, of, of the presentation of the face to the camera and can do so rapidly, will produce a good image which will feed through to an algorithm uh, which will give you an accurate result, uh, which will be easily uh, reviewed by an examiner uh, at the back end maybe or, or maybe accepted uh, straight away. It uh, sounds like mobility is becoming a big part of this because you know just the ordinary smartphone camera 
at least in my experience, a little square goes around what it sees as a face, and it goes around what I see as a face. It can even tell a cat's face. So th that is a new technology that's been integrated first into smartphones, again, probably based on neural network technology, that's doing face detection uh, and, and maybe even quality assessment uh, in real time to ensure that what comes out of that process is, is a good image. And, and that supports high, high accuracy recognition downstream. Sure, and Nick, I imagine you know, at the FBI level, maybe you look both to the, what's happening in consumer development for this new accuracy and speed, but also military, because they have algorithms and systems that can see things in the dark and identify what are figures versus what are bushes tumbling in the dark, say, for example. Absolutely. We have a very close relationship with the Department of Defense, and we actually have some of their staff in our Biometric Technology Center in Clarksburg, West Virginia. So uh, we, we definitely want to leverage what the partner agencies are doing and, and apply it wherever appropriate. All right. So, Matt, where does this all lead in terms of, like, product development? Because uh, you've got many components in a system. There's the camera. There's, there's some sort of technology behind the camera and then inside there's processing of an algorithm. How does it all integrate into something that is fast and accurate? Yeah, so that's the importance of looking at the entire ecosystem. So face recognition is a tool in that ecosystem. But as we develop and look at the human factors, how people use something, how they interact with it, we can really enhance that experience. And it's important to realize that face recognition doesn't sit alone in a system. There's a wide variety of factors that can go into determination of an identity. So we use sensor fusion, for instance, to determine, yes, this face was seen, that body was in this area, their phone was in this area. And all of that gets rolled up that and sent. Sens sensor fusion? Sensor fusion. Mm -hmm. So multiple sensors kind of combining contributing pieces to an identity. But most important to realize, as Patrick was talking about, there's a human in the loop at the end. So this face recognition algorithm doesn't always make the final decision. It's reviewed by someone and verified. Yeah, I imagine, Patrick, that's a big issue. That's in many areas, including military and now civilian, is the at what point does autonomy really need to stop and the human and the auditability of that interaction or that decision uh, take place? Certainly in something like a criminal justice setting, then you need to have somebody testify in court uh, and understand what the algorithm did and what the reviewer did. Um, in civil applications, you would be quite happy with a phone to make a decision on its own. Uh, uh, my organization has done work uh, to support the human uh, system interaction uh, and we've evaluated how well human examiners can review difficult pairs of faces. Is it the same person or not? And that's ongoing work and of course you can always challenge a human by degrading the quality of the images. So this is why standards become important and good photography becomes important. Yeah, so uh, that vector idea itself is nevertheless then enhanced by good quality capture in the first place. Yeah, and uh, you know, faces used in, in two modes, sort of one-to-one -one verification, same person or not, but also in this one-to-many mode. And there's a, a paper just published today indicating that the, the, the best humans can remember about 10,000 faces, but the algorithms can uh, successfully identify people in, in tens of millions or hundreds of millions of faces. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there is a difference in, in human capability and just complementing the other, the, the two together is, is, is kind of important in, in real systems. Sure, Nick, how does that affect the FBI, I imagine, a great deal? So absolutely, uh, the, the, the key tenet of our facial recognition program is having a trained examiner on the other side of that candidate list to work through those potential candidates. And uh, I, think you, I think you nailed it when you talked about image quality. As with any biometric, the quality of the image directly impacts the accuracy of the algorithm. So it's of the utmost importance that we take good photographs for those mugshots. That way they can be used later on to search against for serious crimes if an investigative photo exists. Yeah, and it sounds like then that uh, as uh, surveillance technology improves, and we've seen really high resolution color surveillance now. You see these in crime settings and so forth, even on the nightly news, compared to the cameras of yesteryear, which were, you could tell there was somebody in the hallway and that it was a human being, but that was about all you could tell. Seems like the, the infrastructure is improving. Uh, Arun? 
Yeah, I think it's fair to say the camera technology in general has increased greatly. Um, my, my personal perception is that it, you know, it's slowly been driven again by the mobile phones and people getting lower cost, more capable cameras into those things. And those, those types of cameras being placed largely almost everywhere. Um, so there's a couple of things there. Um, like so with better cameras, we are getting, uh, generally speaking, we, 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 it is more helpful for facial recognition. We still have issues around, again, lighting and pose and all those types of things. Uh, the algorithms are getting more resilient and more, more robust to accommodate those different issues. So it's, it's allowing greater uh, flexibility in how we collect and how we deploy and how we use these different technologies. Yeah, um, and, and the implication there then, Matt, is that an integrated system is really what, what is most practical in this and not just the best algorithm in a, in a vacuum. Exactly, you have to really look end to end. And part of that is as cameras are getting better, it's important to realize that you can't necessarily replace an entire infrastructure that's already out there. So working with the government, working with military divisions, um, being able to train up the algorithm and work with very low quality data when necessary means that you don't necessarily have to replace all the cameras that are out there. You don't have to replace the sensors. You can use those and still give accurate and secure results. Almost a continuous improvement system exactly. as different ends, different pieces of the, of the product chain come out. Go ahead and do that, but you don't have to throw everything out. Exactly. We're improving every aspect of the system, but we always try to work with what exists and how we can upgrade. So we always identify that path. Okay, on that note, we'll take a short break here. This panel discussion is using facial recognition to secure the homeland and enhance customer experience. Sponsored by NEC on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network.